again, some of my better students on the main test wound up getting 60s and 40s on the pass. The pass is the way it was constructed is not indicative of how you're going to do. Now, having said that, the next pass will not be given with the next test. But, now I had a couple of students from abroad laugh almost out loud when I said this this morning, I want to say it. The next pass is a map. And on a map, I've got 10 things about I want you to identify. I want you to identify on a map, North America, South America, Rome, Greece, India, China, Israel. Now, I'll be, going, I'll be writing all these down later, so don't worry about this much stuff. You couldn't keep up. Now, I had a student last semester identify Australia. I couldn't count that because I didn't ask for it. And some of you may think, hey, that's ridiculously easy. You'd be surprised how many 19, 20, 21 year old college students cannot find Arabia on a map and can't even find India on a map. And we're going to be talking about India. Now, hopefully, both for those of you who don't know, it's right here. You can see the map. If you can't see it, come in closer. Uh, that's, that's India on the map. Uh, again, it almost seems like I'm insulting your intelligence that this is more of a for junior high students, but amazingly, a lot of people, now Israel, of course, is right here. Rome, that's halfway down the western side of the Italian boot. I call it a boot. Greece, yeah, right here. Uh, again, why am I picking these places? Because these are the places we will, we will have studied by the time you take your next pass. And so when I talk about India, I want you to be able to picture in your mind this peninsula right here, somewhat in the shape of the Greek letter delta, except upside down. All right, now, India. Now, folk, some of what I'm about to say might sound fantastic. I'm sorry if it does, but what I, I promise you that this, at least, is standard geology. There was a time in Earth's history when all the continents were together into one big supercontinent. This continent was called Pangaea. Now this used to be in a book. Why it isn't now, I don't know. Then the continents split off and went their separate ways. North America, you can see on a map here where North America, if you put it up next to you, especially if you include the continental shelves, which is partially underwater, the continental shelves and North America fits pretty snug with North Africa. And in fact, Georgia's soil is a lot like Morocco's soil because uh, Georgia was once joined to Morocco and uh, Western, uh, the Western Sahara right here. They split off. But one of them had the unique experience. India started off down here and floated across the Indian Ocean and unlike the others, it bumped into southern Asia and pushed up the Himalayan mountains, which is why the Himalayan mountains are the tallest mountains on the face of the earth. Now, I'm just curious, I have to add. How many of you have heard this before? Oh, okay, almost every hand in the room went up. Okay, so it's no big surprise to you. All right. Anyway, um, now. Something else that I want to add in, and this is not in a book, but I want to be mentioning from time to time throughout the semester. When the continent split, it threw up a whole lot of greenhouse gases that warmed up the whole globe, and the whole Earth had a uniform tropical climate. This era is known as the Cretaceous period. I'm not going to write it down yet. I might later. C-R-E-A-T-E-O-U-S. And everything was warm, even down here in Antarctica. Antarctica had tropical plants and animals. Everything was warm, and life on Earth was abundant. There were no deserts, no dry areas. This was the age of the dinosaurs, the age of the three and four hundred foot tall trees. Life was never, ever better. The age of the um, large, large uh, buffalo that are larger than elephants are today. I mean, life was never better. You might be about to guess what I'm getting at, folk. When the world is warm, life thrives. When the world pulls down, life dies. The Great Plague of Europe, which you will talk about toward the end, is about the bubonic plague, otherwise known as the Black Death, was caused by 
a cooling of the climate. It not only affected Europe, it affected North America, it affected China, it affected all the Northern Hemisphere, because all the Northern Hemisphere cooled down. And then a great cooling, a little ice age occurred in the 1600s, and it killed off people in droves. The bubonic plague ended when the earth started warming. The best thing that could happen to us, folks, is for the earth to warm up. Now, that's not politically correct. But I said the worst thing that could happen to us is for the earth to cool down. What we're living in now is an ice age that needs to warm up. Now, if anyone wants to dispute that, this time I probably won't cut you off, won't argue, I'll let you have the floor for a few minutes or two. Anybody want to dispute it? I keep wondering, what's all the fuss about global warming? That global warming is bringing on the massive snowstorms that they're having in Ohio and Midwest and New England caused by global warming. Um, the Senate was going to have a meeting about global warming a few years ago. They had to call the meeting off. Too much snow for the senators to get to the Capitol. So told about the story about Al Gore, who's a big chin of global warming. He was fighting to keep his car on the road. He was trying to get to a meeting, but uh, he was having trouble. His car was slipping and sliding all over the place. There was a blinding snowstorm he couldn't see. He was on his way to a meeting to discuss global warming. Yeah? Well, uh, there's some science that would show that global warming is, uh, you know, as the temperature heats, you know, yeah, yeah. rises, so it pushes cold air in places that it typically isn't. Yeah. You know, well, it, I, I see your point. I mean, some people say that global warming would bring a freezing in some places. If it is happening, it yeah. could, to me, it would be the best thing that happened to us. Yeah, I agree. But I think that's, yeah. that's why, uh, because of the snow thing, that's why it's uh, now just called climate change. Right? Instead of global warming, because it's the northern warming. part of the world is not experiencing a lot of warming. Now, the southern part might be experiencing a bit of warming. All right, we've got to move on from there. Um, all right, anyway, getting back to India, the earliest civilization we know about in India is the Harappan civilization. I mean, it's H-A-R-A-P-P-A-N. I mean, I didn't put the in here because Harappa is the name of the city. Um, we have found two big cities that are part of the Harappan civilization, Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. And these civilizations were located along the banks of the Indus River, which is today part of Pakistan. Now, the Harappan civilization had writing, and unfortunately we cannot decipher the writing because we don't have enough of it. None of their literature survives, so we don't know if their literature that determines a lot of their thought patterns and what they enjoyed reading, what they believed, and unfortunately none of that has survived. So we don't really know what kind of thought patterns they had. But what we do know about them, uh, judging by their cities, is they seem to have had no palaces, indicating, and they seem to have had no slum areas, and there was no poverty people, indicating that they had a nearly egalitarian society. <clears throat> you might think, hey, it wasn't that great. Now, communists will not agree, because they say that the egalitarian society is in the future. Karl Marx would hardly agree. but. Nevertheless, here's the problem with egalitarian societies, and I'll be mentioning this when it comes to the American Indians. The North American Indians, and most of your Indians in South America, had an egalitarian society also. No money, no social classes, complete equality. Everybody got fed, whether we worked or not. And their cultural level was what I would call almost zero. Now, the people of Harappa, I mean these Indian Indians now, we're back to the Indians again, they lived a little bit higher, but the, the, the society appears to have been a very stagnant society. The size of the bricks remained the same. The bricks were all fired the same way, folk, for maybe a thousand or more years. Now, something else about this society. It's believed by archaeologists, the deeper you dig, the earlier the city was made, then the newer city was built on top of the old. The deeper you dig, the better the city appears to be. And the higher you get, the more decay you see. 
In other words, after a while, they started making bricks that were definitely of inferior quality uh, than the earlier bricks had been. Um, indicating that, hey, something is backwards here. Just like we find in ancient Egypt. The farther back you go in time, the higher they were. Advanced a little bit far, forward in time, and the lower they were. Um, again, a little bit backwards. All right. Anyway, the Harappan civilization came to an end, and it might have come to an end rather suddenly. The city of Mohenjo-Daro. It was not rediscovered till 1922. And folk, nobody knows how could a city have been lost for 3,000 years. And the fact is, it really wasn't all that well covered up. I mean, it was just it was there, okay, where it's always been. But nobody went to it. When archaeologists began to go inside it, they discovered that there were unburied skeletons. That folk reminds you of Pompeii. All right, now Pompeii, Italy, was a city that was where a volcano erupted. I mean, this was done in the full light of history. The year was 71 CE, so we know about it because there were records. And then in full light, of history, and a bunch of volcanic ash fell and covered the people. So when our archaeologists went into Pompeii, we moved away the ash, and we found. Uh, human remains, some of them were still showing their facial expressions, some of them had a facial expression of pure horror, others of a calm, serene, knowing they're going to die and they accepted their fate. In the case of Mohenjo-Daro, though, all we find are skeletons. The skeletons show people who uh, knew they were dying, I mean, they, they appear to be trying to hide. There's at least the case, one case of a female skeleton trying to cover a smaller skeleton, indicating it's a mother trying to protect her children. Uh, they knew they were dying. Anyway, this city was destroyed by some kind of holocaust. We know it could hardly have been volcano because there's no ash. Some kind of holocaust, we know not what, and then left undisturbed for nearly 3,000 years. Nobody would go in and take the loot. Nobody would go in and bury the dead. And in fact, the people forgot about its existence what happened to it? Well, your book suggests maybe uh, the river course of the river changed. If you actually look up Mohenjo Daro on a web, and I have done it many a time because I'm quite fascinated by this topic. In fact, one of the first papers I did was a paper on the Indus Valley civilizations. But in those days, I didn't have access to the internet. I mean, the internet had been invented, but nobody knew about it. And, but uh, it was invented in 1960s. I'm talking about 1972, 1971 when I did the paper. There are persons who say that Mohenjo Daro was destroyed by a nuclear blast. Now, this may sound fresh at first. There is a blast area, and then the rest of the buildings remain intact. All right, now you might say, what about a meteorite falling from space? Okay, it's possible. However, if something were to hit the United States, the top of the United States Capitol right now and destroy our nation's capital and land right on the Capitol building, you'd almost have to conclude it was a guided missile. Now, there have been meteors, large meteors that hit the Earth. I mean, there's a, the, the astronomers now say, we didn't know this on the kid, but now say, there are enough asteroids and meteorites to where one of them's going to hit the Earth every 100 years. In 1908, one of them hit Siberia, an uninhabited area right up here. The noise was heard 400 miles away. And then 100 years later, in 2013, hit Russia again. Heard about 1,000 people killed no one, but one of them landed. It. Yeah, but it did not land. In other words, it's not like it landed and right smack dab over the Kremlin, you know? Otherwise, it would look like it was guided. Two-thirds of the Earth is underwater, and of the part of the Earth that's above water, about three-quarters of it is sparsely inhabited, if inhabited at all. So the chances of a meteorite hitting an inhabited area, the center of the activity, are really small. However, it's possible. 
there is a chance that Mohenjo Daro is hit by a meteorite, but it would have been very strategic. A very strategic hit. That, but the level of radioactivity, I'm talking about 2015 now, is still so high in Mohenjo Daro that it's dangerous to live in. Which indicates the level of radioactivity 3,000 years ago would have been much, much, much higher. Radioactivity decays over a period of time. This, I'm seriously thinking about making your next project, which I have not yet finished because of the work I've done in the test I haven't started working on. All right, again, eventually another group of people arrived on the scene called the Aryans. Now, this word Aryan is going to make history again later. Anybody, I mean, every, every class, somebody knows who was really fascinated by the Aryans. Hitler. Adolf Hitler. Oh, yes. Now, here is the story of the Aryans. They came from this area of the Caucasian Mountains, uh, or some people say the Pripyat Marshes, even farther north. And about 1800 BCE, a bunch of these people began to fan out. So the Hellens came here and settled in Greece. The Latins moved and settled in Italy. Then a bunch of people moved and settled in Britain and, and uh, France, and even Spain. Your book shows a map of it. But some of them went west, and they settled. These were the Medes and Persians. They settled here, but some of them went beyond. They were the Aryans, and they came here to North India, and they settled in India. Now, at one time, in fact, when I first started teaching, I taught that the Aryans destroyed the Harappan civilization. Then I read the book a little bit more carefully, and also the authors changed their mind on the subject. We now said, we don't know if the Aryans destroyed it, or if the civilization was not already destroyed before the Aryans came. And the Aryans found a big political vacuum. Now I want to say this about government, as bad as we might sometimes hate it. If the Harappan people had no government, then the Aryans might have had an easy picking. People who don't have a society or a social structure where you have people at the top and people of different levels wind up being conquered sooner or later by their enemies. Hey, if anyone of you want to dispute that, I'll listen to you. An example, the American Indians. An example, the Harappans. Another example of massive, mighty Chinese civilization that adopted socialism under the Song Dynasty. And the Mongolians, with a relatively tiny army, came in and took them over. And led by Genghis Khan. We'll talk about that before the semester is over. Um, again, this is pop, but a lot of what happens. Now, the Aryans, when they took over, they were white. The native peoples were black. Now, folk, I don't in any way want to be teaching white supremacy except have to teach about it because it's part of the lesson. The Aryans looked on themselves and their their white skin as being superior to the black peoples who were native. And Adolf Hitler was extremely fascinated by this attitude, and he took up the same attitude. And he described the German people as the Aryans, and the white as being better. Now, folk, I've had some black men do papers on Adolf Hitler. Maybe they don't know, I mean, they're, they're praising how good a man Adolf Hitler was, and maybe they don't know that Adolf Hitler sterilized every black man he could get his hands on to keep them from spreading their genes to another generation. Then he had to sit in the stands and watch you in the 1936 Olympics while a black runner outran all his. The runner's name was Jesse Owens. Some of you may have heard about him. Uh, see a few heads nodding. Yeah, he outran every one of Hitler's white super Aryans. And a black boxer named Joe Lewis knocked out Max Schmeling, a German boxer. White. Max Schmeling was white. Joe Lewis was black. Hitler had to watch that also. Uh, but anyway, um, the Aryans set up a society where that the whites were ahead, but over time, now folk, over time the Aryans themselves became black. Anybody know how this happened? I'll give you a hint. It was not the bright Indian sunshine, even though the Indian sunshine is bright. How did they become black? They intermarried with the local black population. 
and over time they became black. However, they set up a caste system to where the whiter you were, the better you were in society, the higher you looked on, and the darker you were, the worse you were. I mean, folk, I, I can't avoid saying this because it's part of the lesson. Not to, in no way do I agree with it, in no way do I condone it, but nevertheless, this is historical fact, and this is a history class, and it's, it's, it needs to be bought out. Now, something else, I'm a little bit surprised at how many college students do not know this. Yet, I had a student this morning tell me that it was the bright Indian sunshine that darkened their skin. Uh, have any of you heard that acquired characteristics cannot be inherited? By acquired, I mean, all right, they tried an experiment one time, several scientists across the world took some mice, and he said, we're gonna see how many generators take to cut off a mouse's tail before the mice quit growing tails. So they would cut off every mouse's tail, maybe a hundred of them, and then let those mice breed, and measure the tails of the next generation, and they did this for about 50 generations, and on the 51st generation, the mice born, every one of their ancestors, they only had their tails cut off. The 51st generation of mice had tails that were just as long and just as utilitarian as the original mice. Why? Because the mice had tails in their DNA, and unless they change the DNA, they were not going to lose their tails. I mean, they would still be born with tails, and so unless their tail cut. Again, acquired characteristics cannot be inherited. So these Aryans might have been gotten sunburned, but they did not permanently darken their skin until they started intermarrying with the local black population. Now, um, anyway, um, the Aryans had apparently been nomadic herdsmen who were skilled in the arts of war. The people of India have had a problem down through the ages. They've tried to avoid war. And folk, I don't blame them. War is awful and terrible. But in their attempts to avoid war, they wind up bringing it on. I'll have more to say about that in a few minutes. Now, their religion. The religion of India is known as Hindu. Now, I've got to qualify that a little bit. The word Hindu actually means anything that has to do with India, whether it be its culture or its religion. But it also has a double meaning. The word Hinduism talks is a meaning given to the religion of, the, of most of the people of India. Hinduism is known for, uh, well, starting off, if any of you have read my comparative religions that I put posted on iCollege, Hinduism has no founder. Unlike Islam, unlike Christianity, unlike Judaism, we do not know who founded, uh, unlike Zoroastrian, we don't know who founded Hinduism. It appears that the religion evolved over time, as have a few other religions in the world. Um, but one of its main characteristics is the caste system. Now, the caste system does what we humans naturally do. We classify people. We look around and think, hmm, this person, he's better than I am, so I need to show him some respect. Oh, but this person, he's much lower than I am. I mean, now I'm not saying in any way that's right, but I am saying we humans just do this. But in India, they made this tendency into a philosophy or into religion, and they wound up having five main castes. The only one I'm going to have require you to learn is the one at the bottom, but at the top, of course, were the kings and the priests. These were the higher castes, and then the, there was the warrior caste, but now below them, your book names the, gives the name for the caste. Below them were the merchants, but at the very bottom, were the outcasts or the pariahs. These were the people who did the dirty work. They were sometimes called the untouchables. Don't touch them because if you do, you'll become like them. In general, an Indian person could not move up or down a caste during his lifetime. Now, there were some exceptions. Some people started off in poverty and grew up. This has happened in every society down through the ages. India is no exception, but for the most part, you could not move except by way of death. If you lived a good enough life in this life, you could expect to be reincarnated. Re
reincarnation. Now, um, it wasn't just humans. Like, if you led a particularly bad life in this life, you might not even come back as a human at all. You might come back as an animal. And therefore, the people of India regarded all life as sacred, even animal life. And they did it so well that they uh, would not even eat beef. Would not, uh, and they have enough beef cattle in India to completely eliminate all their poverty. But they refuse to eat it because, it's, again, it's their religious belief. But you could be reincarnated, and eventually you would reach a high, high state of existence called Brahman. Uh, that's the, yeah, the Hindu. This was their ultimate existence, and at this point you'd be free from all cares and all worries. Uh, this was the ultimate. Now, they went so far that the wealthier Indian people would hire persons with, with brooms and say, when I walk the streets, I want you to go and sweep the walk in front of me where I will not be accidentally stepping on a bug because stepping on a bug might offend a god so they wouldn't even kill bugs. Now, I have to say this, folk. I have noticed in my lifetime that persons who have a high, high regard for animals oftentimes, much too often, have a low, super cold attitude toward human beings. It got so bad in India that if you were walking on the street and a person beside you dropped over, nobody would care about him. Oh, that's his problem, not mine. Nobody would care. If he dropped dead, eventually a truck would come by looking for bodies, pick up the body, carry it to the edge of the city and dump it into a common grave and shovel it over. If a person got sick, they just dumped him into a house for the sick. No care, whatever. Now, Mother Teresa, a generation or so ago, did a lot to change a lot of this and convince them that, hey, most people who get sick eventually recover. And therefore, uh, you should take care of the sick. But compassion, the Hindu religion is known for being totally, utterly lacking in compassion. Now, again, some of this has changed in uh, more recent times. But uh, compassion was lacking. Um, Anyway, again, if you got sick, it was because you deserved it. Now, uh, I want to back up a little bit. Maybe I should have started off with this. In the beginning, um, the original God was Deus. It appears that at one time the people of India might have been monotheistic. That word deus has been associated with the Spanish dios, and any of you know Spanish, Spanish word for God, or the Greek Zeus, Zeus, dios, again, dios, they, they are a lot alike, because they were, after all, Indo-European also, or the Chinese Shang-Di, which we'll talk about on Wednesday, Shang-Di that the Chinese worshipped originally. Um, Again, it had to do with deity, uh, Zeus, yeah, deity. Again, some people believe that the original religion of mankind was monotheistic, but eventually Deus began to be looked as they began to be looked on as being somewhat distant. He was replaced by other gods, and your book goes into some detail about some of the gods they eventually started to worship. Um, Indra, a thunder god, I'm not going to write that down. Then Varuna, a god of justice who eventually became Vishnu. Um, they had wound up having gods for wind, for fire, for fertility, for wealth, and so forth. They wound up having more than a million gods in their pantheon. Now, if you talk to a person from India today, and he knows you're a monotheist, he would say, oh, we Indians are monotheists also. All these million gods or so that we have, they have a god for each branch of the family, each city, each local tribe. They say all these moons of God actually are part of the one same spirit, so they're all united. So really they're all one, just different manifestations of the same spirit. And uh, again, they will tell you that they're monotheist. 
they'll also try to tell you something else about the caste system. They'll tell you, oh, we now, we don't treat our outcasts badly anymore. In some cases, that's true. But there was a case not too long ago where that an Indian man, an Indian father killed his daughter because she dated a man from a different caste. This crime occurred not in India. No, folks, it occurred here in the United States. They took the case to judge the judge in the man said, this is my religion. I, believe, I thought we had religious people here. The judge said, well, we can't allow that here and sentenced the man to a long prison term for murder. Um, again, we were having a big problem in this world as to how much we grant religious freedom and what's tolerated and what isn't. Um, a few years ago, I asked, I had a show of hands, how many of you have heard of this crime? And several years ago, almost everyone in the class said, today you probably may have forgotten about it, but this, this actually happened. They still do not allow people to marry in another caste. They'll tell you they do. Now, again, you talk to a person who goes up, oh, our persons from this caste can marry that caste. But in actual reality, you're better off in most cases if you don't. Um, what they tell you when they know you're different and what they actually do is sometimes two different things. All right. Um, now. Their religious books are called the Vedas. Now that looks like it should be pronounced Vedas, and I did until actually I had a pupil correct me about two years ago, but it's pronounced Vedas. The earliest Veda is the Rig Veda. These are their religious hymns. Now, folk, the Rig Veda. And I'm not being trying hard not to be disrespectful of any religion. Rig Veda is spelled R-I-G-V-E-D-A. For those of you I see some of you in the back are having a hard time seeing it. All right, I like that. Uh, Rig Veda. Again. I hope you won't just take my word for it. Look it up. In the Rig Veda, and folks, this is the absolute truth, there are stories about flying airplanes and even visiting other planets. Their airplanes could do things that are, I mean, we have airplanes that can land on water and then take off, but supposedly their airplanes could land, sink into the water like submarines. Then emerge out of the water and take off flying again. We do not have, as far as I know, unless it's super secret, we do not have an airplane that can do that. When they show diagrams of their planes, some of them look a lot like modern day airplanes. Some of them appear to have fire coming out the back end of them, which makes the move, which reminds us of our jet aircraft or even our rockets. Now, folk, again, you can take care of whatever you want to. Um, a lot of people believe that they actually had them. And Adolf Hitler so strongly believed that he actually sent teams of people into India to find the a copy of the original Rig Veda to try to build super weapons. And you may or may not know Adolf Hitler developed the jet aircraft before the Allies did. If he developed it a year earlier, he might have won the war. But, as it was, I mean, I mean, I put together a lot of gadgets. I put together a lot of radios, and uh, recently, up for my daughter and UGA, I put together a square box, except for one thing. It wasn't a square, and it took me three or four hours to get the square in the way enough to where the top would fit over the bottom. You might think, isn't making a square it's simple, but we haven't done it in many, many years. It's kind of hard, but what I'm saying is that all fit those jets it took a year to get the bugs out. I mean, hey, I've seen airplanes put together, and sometimes they don't work the way that they appear to work on paper, and then you have to go to figure out what's wrong with them. Um, in the case of Hitler's jets, they didn't work very well at first either, and it took a year to figure out how to even fly. But once they got them to fly, they terrified American pilots. But fortunately, our ground troops were winning. But uh, in other words, did Hitler copy 
I mean, Hitler's men copy what they had read in the Rig Veda. Um, again, I'll leave that topic for now. Um, another part of their religion was asceticism. Ascetic or asceticism. Asceticism believes that if you deprive yourself, like go through long periods without eating or as long as possible without drinking, or if you lie on a bed of spikes or walk on hot coals, that it will free up your spirit to communicate with the spirits in the spirit world. Now again, each of you can make up your own mind for yourself how much this would be, because a lot of Christians have believed this also, that they can get closer to God through deprivation, fasting, and some even Christian people have taken and beaten themselves to... Uh, drive sin out of their system. And in no way, folks, my advocate, and I have to mention because it is a part of the lesson. Asceticism, you can get close to the gods. Now, when I was in the army, during basic training, we were not allowed to read anything, not allowed to listen to the radio or have newspapers. Then they got to advanced training, and we actually had some free time, time off. I mean, basically, they gave you no time off, whatever. I found a book lying around, and I picked it up. It was a book about Hinduism. And it told about a man who wanted to become a, like a god, so he put his arms up and held them up like this for 100 years, tiptoe for 100 years, extremely difficult position. And the god was so impressed that he made him the lord of three planets. So he was ruling over these three planets and uh, living forever because of his deprivation and what they call holiness. Again, yeah, each of you can make up your own mind yourself what you believe. But asceticism was a big part of it. A lot of it involved yoga, transcendental meditation. And I want to say this about yoga. A lot of the young men and women of my generation, 40 and 50 years ago, went to India to find, you might say, spiritual peace or to find spiritual fulfillment. They went there and they found sanitation conditions not at all to work. And finally, the Indian government told them, go back home and find your spiritual fulfillment at home. We cannot tolerate you here, and you can't tolerate us. Our standards of sanitation are not up to your level. And all you'll do here is get sick, and a lot of them did. So, uh, in effect, go back home. But a lot of Americans have taken an interest in yoga, um, transcendental meditation, again, believing that they can get close to the spirit world, or some people believe yoga training is a good way to control appetites, to lose weight. A lot of you might know a good bit more about this than I do, but it comes from Hinduism. All right. Um, now, this takes us up to another branch of India's religion known as Buddhism. Now, the story I'm about to tell you Now, this was not his real name, but this is the name he's known by, so this is the name I'll use to describe him, Buddha. There was a man who prophesied over the young Buddha. Buddha was a young prince. His father was king, and the man prophesied, this man is going to become an ascetic. Well, the king did not want his son to become an ascetic, in other words, to become a person who did a lot of fasting. So he tried to steer Buddha away from everything that would be sorrowful. So he was going to make sure that Buddha never ran into a sick person, an old person, or a poor person. So every time Buddha went for a stroll, servants would go ahead and they'd chase away everybody who was old, sick, or infirm. And I don't know if Buddha's grandparents were already dead or not, and I don't know how he handled the death of any cousins if he had any, but essentially Buddha never knew anything about sorrow, never knew anything about deprivation, Never knew anything negative. All he had was positive all his life until he was about 20 years old. And somebody was not diligent enough and didn't chase away an old man. And for the first time in his life, Buddha saw a sick old man. And it just, it just decked him. He was more handled. He asked the servant, you mean, are there other people like this? And finally, so, uh, uh, well, uh, we all eventually come. You mean, I'm going to become like this man myself? You mean, everybody become, and all oh, it just, just, I mean, he couldn't handle it. He became the ascetic his father feared he would be. He went around depriving himself, trying to find peace for his troubled mind. And eventually he formed a new religion. The heart of his religion was that desire was what made us evil. When we got rid of desire, 
all pain and suffering would at least appear to cease. Have no interest in this world or any of its pleasures or any of its uh, benefits or its goodness. Just get rid of desire. Um, the religion became a little bit more complex than that. It eventually evolved into what he called the middle path that emphasized right. Eight, and don't memorize these, but there were eight right things, and I'll name a few of them. Right occupation, right speech, right meditation, uh, right... I believe diet might have been in there, right? To right work. And uh, if you've got all eight of these right, you could expect to have a happy life in the afterlife. He um, was more egalitarian than um, Hinduism, and that's why he attracted a whole lot of the lower caste of people. And also, he was more, the women were more equal under Buddhism than they were under Hinduism. And that might have helped attract a lot of persons also. Um, in fact, when we visit India later, medieval India, we'll find that Buddhism almost threatened to take over India. It's still prominent in India, still strong, but it never did take over in India, partly because Hinduism realized it had to reform itself. Now, Buddhism went on to take over much of the civilized people living here in Southeast Asia and in what is today Indonesia and the Philippines. It tried to spread into China and Japan and Korea. It made a lot of headway here in Korea. In China, the Chinese, as we're going to find out, generally did not embrace a foreign religion until 1948 when they embraced communism, which was a foreign religion of sorts. Uh, the Japanese, again, they got a lot of converts. So it spread toward the east, but it never really completely took over India. Now, I have seen some pictures of Buddha or statues, and some of the statues show them to be really, really skinny, and others show them to be overweight, obese, fat, call it what you will. And I got to thinking of which ones of these are true, and I finally began to realize that probably they both are. As a young man, he fasted himself to emaciation. Now, folks, I've had a lot of students who say they've heard this before, a surefire way to gain weight is to fast a lot. How's that? Because when you fast, your body goes to emergency mode, and when you eat, your body quickly turns everything you eat into fat because you're storing away in case of another emergency. At least to see one head nodding, you've heard this before. Um, skipping breakfast. If you're trying to lose weight, skipping breakfast. Bad news. I've done it myself. Maybe you can see the results. But I think that he's fasted to the point of emaciation as a young man. So as an old man, he became obese. So both, to me, both statues of them are probably right. All right. Um, there's another religion in India. I've got to hurry on. Uh, again, there's a lot more I could say about Buddhism. Another religion called Jainism. It goes to an extreme, and it never became very popular in India because it called for extreme rejection of the world. Now, I had a pupil tell me the Jainians believe that the universe never had a beginning, that what we see is what's always existed, always existed and always will. It just started from never started. It never had a beginning. It went on and on and on. It will go on and on and never will have an end. Just uh, on and on like this. Now, again, if you've heard differently or know differently, I would welcome your comments. Um, the problem of beginnings, how we began, is a big part of religion. Anyway, after the major religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism came on, um, political history. The people of India were at least partially conquered by the Persians for a time. The Persians, now again, none of these people made headway deep into India. And then when I'm saying this, I'm talking about the Persians, Alexander the Great, and the Muslims who came later. Now, the British came and they conquered all of India. But for 3,000 years, India has been ruled by foreigners or invaded by foreigners a lot. Uh, 
and again, a lot of that reason is because of their, their uh, emphasis on peace. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But anyway, uh, one of Alexander's five, after being conquered by Persians, they were partially conquered by Alexander. I'm going to spend maybe 30 minutes talking about Alexander the Great when we get toward the end of the chapter on Greece. He started out here in Macedonia. He's a Macedonian, and he went all the way to India. Now, folk, Alexander claimed that his father was Zeus. And again, you can look this up. You don't have to believe it. But unlike the other generals, when he went to battle, the other generals would stay off at a distance and watch their men fight. Alexander marched in the front of his army with his men behind him, and the enemy, he was the first person to engage the enemy. And he won every battle he faced, ex no exception, and he never was wounded until, until he came to India. Now, the history books would tell you that he was hit by an Indian arrow, and he was wounded so badly he was never quite the same again, and his men became so concerned that finally his men, from the generals to the privates, told him, we, re we refuse to go any farther, and even Alexander had to listen to his men, and he said, headed back for Babylon. And there in Babylon, he died of a combination of possibly his wound, or a fever, or a drunken stupor, or maybe again a combination of all those. We're not sure. All right, folk. It may sound far out, but there have been persons who say that they believe that Alexander was actually hit by an Indian guided missile that an ordinary arrow would not have damaged him, but that India was the only country at the time who had the weapons, secret weapons, that could really hurt him. Be that as it may, you can decide for yourself what you believe. But he did stop in India, and he wound up turning around. This is standard history. He was wounded while in India. Again, all this is standard history, and he did not live long after he was wounded. He died in the city of Babylon. One of his followers was Chandragupta Maria. Now, I say he was his follower. Chandragupta Maria may have been a follower. Anyway, when Alexander left, Chandragupta Maria set up an empire and started the Mauryan dynasty. It was to rule part of India for a time. And he conquered much of India, finished the job that Alexander was not allowed to do, if he really was a... Anyway, he started the Mauryan dynasty. And one of his descendants was a man named Asoka. Asoka actually conquered almost all of India. Asoka was known for some trade, but then after Asoka had conquered India, he converted to Buddhism. He stopped his conquest. And he um, began, well, began moving around all of India, setting up places that were sacred to Buddha. In other words, every place where Buddha did this, Buddha meditated here, and he would call these places stupas. Um, these were the holy places that Buddha's presence had made holy. And they were set up by Chandragupta Maurya. Um, now, um, again, he tried to foster trade and convert his people to Buddhism, uh, but after he died, India fell into a period of political disunity, and they had a period of time called the rule of the fishes. In effect, nobody was powerful, but they had a whole bunch of kings, and these kings would like make sport of war. In other words, they looked on war almost where we look at our big league football games. Um, you know, a king would use his army, go to war against another king, and he'd either win or lose. This went on for some hundreds of years. It was about five or six hundred years before anybody became powerful enough to partially unite India again. But to rule the fishes, the big fish would gobble up the little fish. 
It reminds me of a movie I saw once about bullies and the song went, he was a big fish, oh yeah, he was a big fish, oh yeah. And they showed him gobbling up all the little fish. He was a big fish, oh yeah, till a bigger fish. All of a sudden out of the corner of the screen came a really big fish and gobbled him up. The bully woke up just terrified and thinking, hey, I was the bully who got gobbled up by a bigger fish than me. Rule of fishes. Uh, the big fish gobbled up the little ones. Now, um, Some of the terms that you like be expected to see on the next test, and again, I don't know which one you'll get. By the way, I sent the test to the print shop this morning, and if they're not back by next Monday, uh, we can wait till Wednesday. But Raja means high one. Maharaja. See this word Raja here at the end? Raja, Maharaja means very high one, or prince. Um, the ultimate state of Hindu society was Brahman. The ultimate state of Buddhism was Nirvana. Um, let's see. Um, oh yes, something else they ran into they finally decided that only the highest, I mean the firstborn should inherit the estate called primogeniture. Primogeniture, in other words, only the firstborn, and here's why. France went through a period where that when a king died, he would divide his throne between his sons. Well, if a king had three sons, all of a sudden you'd have three kingdoms. Then if each of those sons had about three or four sons apiece, you'd go all of a sudden from three kingdoms to nine kingdoms. And after a while, I said, hey, you know, this is fragmented. These kings are fighting each other, and none of us are powerful enough to defend us against our outside enemies. We must give the throne to the oldest one only. And then the younger ones can receive maybe titles, nobility, or receive uh, gifts, maybe even receive payments of money, but uh, only the uh, oldest son should inherit the estate. It's called primogeniture. You'll run into this in Japanese history, you run into it in Indian history. Uh, Chinese history, eventually most societies have adopted primogeniture to help keep large estates together. Um, now, your book talks more about the role of women. I'm going to skip that for now, but uh, there is something that I really want to say in closing about Hindu religion. I've hinted this before. It fosters and brings on war. How? By talking peace. Now, between World Wars I, World War I, folks, was so awful that the rest of the world, they actually got together and it had been made a pact to outlaw war. You see how far it got. But it was so terrible that people began preaching. Albert Einstein wrote several books talking pacifism. Now, particularly, the Jews began preaching, or teaching rabbis, began teaching pacifism in their synagogues. Now, my wife is part Jewish, so and I, don't, I know I'm in a Jewish community. I don't in any way intend to say anything against the Jews, except this. Their pacifism was wrong. And today, no Jewish rabbi, as far as I know, teaches pacifism to his congregation. What happened? The Jewish people found themselves being thrown alive into fiery ovens. This, folk is what people will do to you if you will not stand up and fight for yourself. Do I make my point? I hate the idea of fighting. I mean, I've had many a dream. I mean, I was in the army once. I have many a dream of fighting in a war, dreading it. I've often wondered what it's like. As terrible as war is, folks, if you don't fight it, there are people in this world who would come in right now and take everything we have away from us and enjoy doing it and either kill us or carry us off into slavery. No, mankind is not too civilized for that and never has been. We're still the same, and we're being reminded constantly, we're the, still the same humans that these people were back then. If you don't stand up and fight yourself, into this scenario between the wars came Adolf Hitler. You probably know what happened next. The world found itself at war with one or not. Same with India. They talked peace, and before they knew it, they were being invaded by outsiders. The war was forced upon them. All right, have a good day.